surface of the Earth is the shore of the cosmic ocean. On this shore, we've learned most of what we know. Recently, we've waded a little way out, maybe ankle deep, and the water seems inviting. Some part of our being knows this is where we came from. We long to return, and we can because the cosmos is also within us. We're made of star stuff. We are a way for the cosmos to know itself. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Past the entrance hall of the Science Museum in London, there's a dark room with a rocket strung across the ceiling. A suspended orb holds projections of the Earth and the Moon like a crystal ball. Models of shuttles and lunar landers are scattered about, some hanging like movie props, others delicate and small, trapped behind glass like dioramas. A bright yellow plaque asks, how far can we go? while clipped old accents emerge from speakers to try and impress you with what that question really means, to show you outer space without an open sky above. There's a wonder to places like that. It's not an original observation to say that centres of knowledge, like libraries and museums, are akin to secular temples, although some buildings try to evoke that far more than others. The Science Museum, despite its monolithic name, has no monopoly on the feelings that scientific advancements inspire. And there is, naively, falsely, a sense that scientific progress speaks for all of humanity, that when one institution or country makes a breakthrough, everyone else is brought along with it. The reality is always far less idealistic. But for at least 50 years now, there have been children who've grown up with seeing eight or nine planets in picture books strung together like beads on a necklace, who could look up at the night sky and think, that's where I could be. Even if, like me, they couldn't see the stars. Outer Wilds is a grand space adventure, in every sense of that word, but it doesn't start with its home-built ship or its plucky team slash folk band of cosmonauts. It starts with a museum that lays out the whole game in miniature, along with a couple of other elegant in-universe tutorials. Gravity crystals, Nomai writing, and quantum rocks will be out there in the cosmos, so you might as well marvel at them in a safe environment. Outside, there's even a model ship you get to practice with, and probably crash a few times, before you get a chance to fly the real thing. Along with the entrance to a zero-g cave, where you'll practice repairing your ship as mineral-studded walls stand in for twinkling stars. You're inundated with these facsimiles of actual spacefaring, and they'll inevitably pale in the face of the lived experience you'll get in the rest of the game. Yet this is the closest most people get to space, or the fruits of astronomy in general, little placards next to dioramas of stars and satellites. Ironically, these tiny models failing to capture the scale of our universe makes them more wondrous. Just how much don't they show? How much do they miss? The museum, as much as it tries to explain the cosmos, is full of unanswered questions. No one knows where the Nomai came from, or why they vanished, and the jury's out as to why the quantum rock moves around. Especially, no one knows that they're exploring the universe right as it's about to end. When all is said and done, one of the last things the game has to show you is the same museum, and it does have the answers to all those questions. But only then, at the end of everything. As much as Outer Wilds is a game about answers, it's also a game about questions. Asking them, testing them, finding where they lead, figuring out just what's possible in this world. Curiosity is the driving force of the game, because the game never forces you to do anything. It simply leaves its solar system open for exploration and investigation. More than any other adventure game I've played, albeit that moniker is a very loose one, Outer Wilds rewards a scientific approach. Developing a hypothesis, testing it, and literally taking the results on board. The only barrier to progress is knowledge and that progress just yields more knowledge, more and more, until you've wrapped your head around the entirety of the game and its non-linear story. Gradually, wonder turns into understanding. And then, right at the game's end, it turns back into wonder one last time. Which is why I'll say it now. 
Unlike other games that I might talk about, the main gameplay of Outer Wilds is this question asking, this pursuit of answers. By discussing it in full, I'm taking that away from the unfamiliar listener, should you in fact be listening. I'm normally not too concerned with spoilers in a critique of something, because you should talk about the whole thing when you examine it, but I realise, with Outer Wilds, that the game isn't just what you're left with after the credits roll. It's not just the answers you get, it's the questions you ask, the actual process of figuring things out. I really don't want to phrase this as it's about the journey, not the destination, but for Outer Wilds that feels about right. So if you can, try to take that journey. Or at least watch someone else do it. Because, despite all this talk of science and learning and knowledge, Outer Wilds is at points a very spiritual game. Much of the writing on it mentions some kind of peace the author made with death through play, and I will return to that later, but that reaction makes sense. The whole thing's about death, really. Your death, your dozens of deaths, and the death of the whole universe, that's as final as it gets. And yet it still sees outer space with the same wonder-filled eyes as kids in that astronaut phase. It's a game that tells you your save file is an expedition you're embarking on. To buckle up, not to buckle in. So I want to talk about that. About the science of the game and its faith. Its fundamental hope that we can understand the universe and our place in it. In its own quiet way, it reminds you that the universe isn't something to be won or solved or conquered just appreciated while you're there to observe it. You might as well. You'll only be around for another 22 minutes. Although it's easy to apply such broad themes to just about any story, Outer Wilds is about knowledge in a very concrete way. It belongs to a subgenre of games, perhaps a little eye-rollingly, called Metroid Brainiers, the point being that a player's understanding of how it works is all they need to progress, instead of having to find keys for locked doors in a standard Metroidvania arrangement. If you know what to do, you can finish the game on your first loop, and there's even a Steam achievement for doing just that. Yet when you start, it's not even clear what you're meant to do, besides finding some way of escaping your repeating predicament. You set off with a few big known unknowns. Why am I in the time loop? Why does the sun explode? What does any of this have to do with the Nomai? And those big questions might inform your first few space expeditions. The answers are found in smaller questions and oddities first. The musical seed on your homeworld, or the strange wandering moon that disappears behind planets. Bit by bit, you form a comprehensive picture of your situation, and your universe, from these small pieces of knowledge. Outer Wilds' best moments, however, come through experimentation. It is full of situations where the player might say to themselves, I wonder what might happen if… and follow that question through to its consequences. How I got to the Tower of Quantum Knowledge stands out in my memory, from my first playthrough of the game back in 2020. After trying to climb this thing and falling into the black hole beneath, and having to slowly die on the other side since I didn't have meditation unlocked, a thought finally occurred to me. What if I just wait for the thing to fall and access it in zero gravity? On my next loop, I just sat there until the tower fell through, and all I could do was laugh at myself. I was thinking too rigidly that the black hole was a failure state, and that the problem in front of me was all there was. In Alex Beecham's 2013 thesis on the game, as it existed then, he wrote about exploring the fourth dimension. That it, quote, makes when players explore just as important as where." Unquote. The planets will move, the universe will get on without you. It's only by inserting yourself into the gears of these clockwork worlds that you'll get anywhere. The whole game has a particularly scientific character, and I don't just mean that it's fond of science or features characters who are scientists, I mean that progress in the game comes by using the actual scientific method, developing hypotheses, testing them, and moving forward with the results. Errant Signal's two videos on Outer Wilds note the scientific elements of the game very carefully, and I hope to take his observations even further when looking at the game's main gameplay loop. There's an almost roguelike satisfaction to the process, setting out every 22 minutes to access a place at a new time or take a different path. In a loop-based roguelike, you gain mastery through understanding the underlying systems of a game, 
And in Outer Wilds, those underlying systems are things like gravity, black hole teleportation, quantum entanglement, and so on. That's not to say that the game operates off of the hardest possible scientific knowledge. Trees don't magically produce oxygen, and quantum doesn't quite mean the same thing that it does in physics. But it still uses consistent rules you'll get familiar with through successive loops. Even moving around in Outer Wilds is something worth learning. It's clunky and awkward, and when you navigate different gravities you feel like you're piloting your character more than the actual ship. Still, you end up developing a sense for how much you weigh, eventually slingshotting yourself across planets. In the footage I captured for this video, you can probably see me throwing all caution to the wind. I know that whatever I'm looking for is only just a loop away. In keeping with this roguelike comparison, it's interesting that every run starts with the same sight, the probe above Giant Steep being fired off in a different direction. More than the plot point it serves, I think it's a reminder. You're just like that probe shot by the Nomai thousands of times, eventually finding its destination in the eye of the universe. Every time you see it is a nudge towards that ultimate goal. And just like it, you can go whatever direction you want, because nothing stands alone in Outer Wilds. Every piece of information you gain is connected to another, visualised in the rumour mode of your ship's log. It almost feels like you're being let in on the diagrams used by Kelsey Beecham, sister of Alex Beecham and, as far as I can tell, the game's sole writer. A conspiracy theory board's worth of non-linear story. That Outer Wilds allows you to weave this web in any order without feeling contrived is an impressive achievement of narrative design. I've talked about the time loop a few times now, but I want to examine that more closely. Because it's not a real time loop, that's just your experience of it because your memories of previous loops are being sent back in time. That's why if you get to the end of your 22 minutes without dying in the supernova, the loop still ends, because your experiences are being sent to the next version of you by the Ash Twin Project, a version of you that might be able to reach the eye next time. In the statue workshop on Giant's Deep, some of the Nomai who made this possible wonder if there's a substantial difference between sending a body and its memories back in time. And while there might not be a functional difference, I do think there's a subtle philosophical difference on the game's part. Every time you wake up, there was a version of you that lived and died so that the next could move forwards with greater knowledge. Just as you complete the projects of the Long Dead Nomai, you use these iterative versions of yourself these different people, to accumulate enough knowledge to reach the game's end. As in our world, it's impossible to uncover the secrets of the universe in one lifetime. You need generations of people working together to get anywhere. The very gameplay loop of Outer Wilds reminds the player that science is always a work in progress, passed down from one person to the next, even if both the people in that equation are you. As I said earlier, it is hypothetically possible to finish the game on your first loop if you know how. Yet, even if you fail your final voyage, and inadvertently turn off your time machine, the game allows you to try again, in one of the only times it tells you to load previous save rather than resume expedition. I can imagine a much more punitive version of Outer Wilds which erases your save file entirely. You failed, the timeline's lost. But even then, you could still complete it on the next, first loop. The coordinates of the eye could have been randomised in every save file, it is quantum after all, but they aren't. The game even prompts you with the code in the bottom left of your screen while you punch it into the vessel, although I and I think others amusingly assumed you'd have to remember it and wrote it down on paper, so I can actually remember it off at the top of my head now. Once again, your knowledge carries through. All this is to say that the world of Outer Wilds is consistent and your playthrough of it amounts to study. It shows its greatest fondness of science by making the player a scientist of its universe. The joy of learning fuels its central gameplay hook. More than anything, knowledge is its own reward. Yet all that knowledge comes at a cost. The game is, as many have noted, heavily preoccupied with death. It's inevitable, after all. Outer Wilds is as much about death and how people deal with it as it is about its time-travelling premise. The death of people, civilizations, the whole universe. It begins by mentioning, quite insistently, the possibility of fatal failure in space travel, 
that many ships have broken down and that the first flight by Feldspar could only be called that generously. Even one of the dialogue options you can choose with astronomer Hornfels is I'm ready to die in space, an attitude that ironically will carry you far in Outer Wilds. For the Apollo 11 mission, the White House had prepared a letter to be read in the event of the deaths of Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, part of which reads, These two men are laying down their lives in mankind's most noble goal, the search for truth and understanding. And it goes on to say, quote, In ancient days, men looked at the stars and saw their heroes in the constellations. In modern times, we do much the same, but our heroes are epic men of flesh and blood, unquote. Men of flesh and blood, unfortunately, are much harder to keep alive in space, no matter how epic they may seem. While your death in a supernova is a constant, there are a lot of ways to die in Outer Wilds. You could fall from a great height, get crushed, burned, asphyxiated, even eaten. Many players ignore where their autopilot is taking them and fly straight into the sun. As beautiful as a game's world is, it's also an uncaring world. It moves on with or without you until the sun explodes and the loop resets. The worst deaths in Outer Wilds, however, are the slow ones. You might leave your ship to do repairs and watch it float away, and all you can do is wait for the six real-life minutes it takes for your oxygen to run out. I remember this being quite disquieting when it happened in an early loop of my first playthrough, just having to sit there with nothing to quiet your thoughts but the increasingly shallow breaths of your avatar. There was no way for me to skip to being dead, so I had to sit there, just dying. As a somewhat avid roguelike player, I immediately wondered if this game had a reset run button. And it does, just not one you can use straight away. Fellow cosmonaut and time loop enjoyer Gabro can teach you to meditate when things seem completely hopeless. While having this from the start of the game would certainly be convenient, I did make a beeline for it in the playthrough I did for this footage, I actually think holding off on this is beneficial for the player experience. Without a reset button, you treat your early loops with care. You naturally avoid death and hold onto your life preciously. Trips to Brittle Hollow, for instance, have real stakes because falling into the black hole won't kill you. You'll have to live out the remainder of the loop either drifting through space or slowly making your way back via the white hole station. And that's not much better than dying. Eventually, death will stop being scary in Outer Wilds because it is an inevitability and you come to accept that. Yet coming to terms with death isn't easy. It takes time and effort and in the protagonist's case, someone to show you how. I've wondered if there's a slightly sinister element to that. As you go on, your life becomes more expendable, just an instrument in achieving your goal. In his video Time Loop Nihilism, Jacob Geller describes the tendency for time loop stories to brush aside the awful actions of protagonists in timelines that quote unquote never happened. The end of the loop justifies the means taken to get there, it seems. In Outer Wilds, that nihilism seems to be applied to yourself. I know that if I fall off a cliff or miss an opportunity, I'll just sigh and meditate my way into the next loop. Is the peace you achieve with death simply… apathy? I'm not so sure. Despite the game having an inflexible time limit, it sure gives you a lot of time to wait, especially if you haven't unlocked meditation. Even sleeping at campfires to pass time wasn't in the original launch of the game. Yet none of that waiting time is really wasted. It's a chance to ruminate on what you've learned, it's not dead air. The game could have, for example, placed your wake-up spot at a higher elevation, making it effortless to get into your ship if you had the launch codes, but instead you have to ascend the lift before takeoff every single loop. It's only a few seconds long, but it forces you to stop and ask yourself, what am I going to do with my time? It's ironic that the game forces you to spend that time doing nothing, to make you realise how valuable it is. What's death in the face of a life well lived, after all? In my mind, the most obvious comparison with how Outer Wilds approaches death is The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. It's macabre for an adventure game, its time loop ending disaster has a similarly cosmic source, and many of its characters struggle in the face of impending doom. Outer Wilds even has a Lost Wood section, where you navigate a mysterious forest by following music, although that's from Ocarina of Time, of course. 
Unlike Majora's Mask, however, your job isn't to save the world, because you can't avoid it ending, as you might initially assume. All you can do is ensure another universe follows after. The eponymous mask is the source of the moon crashing into Termina, and defeating it lets time finally move forward. There's no evil force to fight in Outer Wilds. As in our universe, the greatest killers have no malevolence at all. Ghost Matter is the game's stand-in for the dangerous forces in our world that are invisible to the naked eye, radiation in particular. An intermittent inconvenience, the strange thing about Ghost Matter is that it's found everywhere, and if you delve inside the interloper, you'll find its source. The comet's shape evokes the anglerfish you'll find in Dark Bramble, and it turned out to be a similar lure. The Nomai were there as it cracked open, flooding the whole solar system and killing everything not submerged in water instantly. No warning, nothing to be done. One day there was a civilization, the next day there were bodies. Like a gamma ray burst, the interloper is something quite natural in the universe that's completely anathema to life. Something so simple and energetic when life needs so many things to go right to even exist. The interloper is also one of the only parts of the game whose knowledge relates to nothing else. You can even see that in the ship's rumour mode, as it has its little unlinked corner of nodes. It's a literal dead end, a grim memento that what ends lives, what ends us, may not be predictable or narratively satisfying. No matter what I've said about death in Outer Wilds, how it's ever present, how you face it, and how it forces you to use your time well, this type of death will always haunt us. Random, simple, unfair death where you don't have enough time to make peace with anything at all. Given all this talk of death, who'd actually want to be an astronaut in the first place? A small comfort in Outer Wilds is that, despite the fact that the fate of the universe rests on you, in a way, you aren't adventuring alone. There are NPCs out in the solar system who are, it turns out, completely unnecessary to interact with to complete what you need to do. Yet your character wouldn't have become an astronaut without them, and they're on the same quest for knowledge. Their campfires are little safe havens, accompanied by trees and jetpack fuel, and always equipped with marshmallows, a piece of your home brought out into the cosmos. Fire is so often used as a symbol of knowledge and technology along with its dangers, Yet, Outer Wilds draws attention to its comforting qualities. Your home planet is a hearth, your very own Earth one letter removed, its own source of domestic warmth. Besides, you have to put in special effort to hurt yourself with the campfires. Each of the game's astronauts loosely represents a different branch of scientific knowledge. Chert's an astronomer, Rybeck's an archaeologist, Gabbro's some kind of explorer, and Feldspar's a hotshot pilot. Most astronauts go through aeronautical engineering first, after all. With each of these characters in their fields of study, you gain context for your journey, and versions of them play out the universe in one final song at the game's end. But I want to focus on Feldspar for a moment. The spaceship you fly in Outer Wilds is barely held together, it's made of wood for god's sake, and it gets damaged very, very easily, at least with the way I play. Feldspar flew far worse, far more dangerous versions of this ship, and now, Despite being stuck in the deepest chasms of Dark Bramble, they seemingly don't have a care in the world. Is this the kind of brazenness that Outer Wilds sees in astronauts? Maybe it's not so much brazenness as emptiness. There's a quote commonly attributed to USSR cosmonaut Vitaly Sevastyanov, although I cannot for the life of me find a good source for it, where he's asked what he can see during one of the Soyuz missions. Quote, What do I see? I replied. Half a world to the left, half a world to the right, I can see it all. The Earth is so small." Unquote. There's a strangeness in Outer Wilds to how small the planets you're exploring actually are. Of course they're representational. We must imagine the Nomai and the Harthians as much larger than the parts of their homes we can explore in-game. Yet these tiny worlds might have, inadvertently, captured something of the melancholy of spaceflight. Feldspar is defined by their almost irresponsible fearlessness, but when you meet them they tell you that, quote, You're a little young to understand, but it's a lot of pressure, being the best that ever was. 
but nice to have a break. Unquote. Like Sevastinov, their thoughts don't go to the cosmic. The concerns of astronauts can be small, because our world is small. The same could have be said for Chert, who's perhaps the only character in the game who really internalises how bad your situation is. As the loop progresses, you get to see Chert realise that the stars are all dying. Oh, why did we have to be born at the end of the universe, they ask. Chert doesn't get a retry like you. They just face the existential insignificance of their species head on, going full-blown nihilist later in the loop. Quote, Oh, who cares? What does it matter? Nothing matters anymore. The sun is about to go supernova, and me, all my research, my life's work, wasted. Unquote. It's sad watching them go through this, because your perspective is so different, fundamentally altered by having an infinite number of tries to accept this fate. Yet Chert does accept it, perhaps a little emptily, as the first notes of the track End Times begin to play. Quote, Come, sit with me, my fellow traveller. Let's sit together and watch the stars die. Unquote. If you tell them you're in a time loop, they dismiss it as a coping mechanism, which, in a funny way, it is. When confronted with death, not all of us will act as calmly as we'd like. Perhaps we'll feel the pointlessness and the unfairness of it instead. There is an infinitesimally small chance that anyone listening to this is an astronaut. Who knows? Share this with your astronaut friends, well-connected listener. Or maybe space travel's become incredibly common since I wrote this, and what I'm saying is sounding out of some impossibly slim data slate in 20 god knows what. But in the here and now, there's still a perilous magic in spacefaring. We see, in Outer Wilds' as astronauts, examples of different reactions to the same universe. How people deal with a place so hostile to life, so uninterested in revealing itself to us. Furthermore, they show that science is a collective effort. Just as you wouldn't be in space without your fellow travellers, you wouldn't be able to accomplish anything there without the work of the Nomai. You'll find all the relics they left behind and put them together millennia after their creators died. The protagonist isn't special because of who they are, they just lie at the synthesis of all this knowledge, the meeting point behind which generations of people stand. I can't help but see in these characters a belief in some essential goodness of Harthians and humanity. That while we were here, we tried to understand where we were, and tried to reach the eye of our universe, even if we didn't know that's what we were doing. After all this learning, and all this death, we're left with the secular soul of Outer Wilds, its we're all made of stardust philosophy that most clearly colours its final moments. I'm not surprised people come away from Outer Wilds with something spiritual. In an article for Games Radar, for instance, Alex Avar talks about his playthrough of the game as a religious experience, writing that, quote, It's a game, like most games, about death, but it embraces the open arms of the Grim Reaper like an old friend encouraging its players to appreciate life's fragility as an opportunity to consider what it means to be mortal in the first place." Unquote. I disagree with his conclusion, however, that Outer Wilds has no intention of offering its own answers, that it, quote, "...merely prompts players to think, and more importantly feel, the weight of their transcendent scale." Unquote. I do think the power of Outer Wilds' ending comes from its open-endedness. The fact it doesn't tell you anything allows you to just experience the significance of your actions via interaction. Yet, I think, the perspective of the game becomes clearest at its end. Eivard even remarks on its beautifully humanist story, and I couldn't agree more with that. For a narrative that concerns a whole universe, it wraps up in a profoundly personal way. I've skirted around discussing the eye of the universe for long enough, despite reaching it being the path to the game's true ending. The only reason you're in this time loop, to be sure, is because the Nomai quested for the Eye. You're fundamentally entwined with the search for it, and getting to it is the only way to dodge the end of the universe, even if you can't stop it from happening. Throughout the game, your perception allows you to move forward, whether that's through the Nomai door marbles that follow your line of sight, literally opening via examination, or the quantum objects that lock in position when observed. When you finally get to the Eye, the source of all things quantum in the universe, 
It only resolves with your perspective, as infinite potentials collapse into the singularity of a new universe. It is an I, after all, in two ways. You get to stare at the abyss and it stares back, and, like being in the eye of a storm, the only thing that survives the end of the universe is you. It's you, the conscious observer, that allows the cycle of creation to continue. Again, much of this is pointed out in the videos from Errant Signal, that the game posits that perspective brings something into existence and that nothing is truly real until it's observed, and again, I want to take this further. At the point of the game's ending where you search a dim echo of your home planet for each of your fellow astronauts, the path to Gabbro involves following their quantum poem. Quantum poem? That's strange, isn't it? The quantum rocks in the game are unnerving. They move when you aren't looking at them, and the signal scope you have makes this haunting choral sound when you point it their way. But looking at this bizarre phenomenon, Gabbro saw how it could be turned into art. What lasted to the end of everything was something we made of the universe, not what it was without us. Tom Marks, writing for IGN, describes how, quote, The message of Outer Wilds, as I interpreted it, is ultimately this. We're all going to die. Do what you want, go where you want, see what you want, but it'll come eventually. You can fight it, or put it off, or deny it entirely, but what you do with the time you have, and who you choose to spend it with, is more important than where we all end up. Unquote. Finding each traveller involves interacting with something they did with their lives. Dodging anglerfish for feldspar, taking a shuttle for Solanum, looking through ruins for Rybeck. It's these deeds that survive, even after all the stars have gone out. Any mortal labour, be it scientific or artistic, is time well spent, because it helps us understand ourselves. But just who is our self? The protagonist of Outer Wilds is rarely talked about in discussions surrounding the game, despite their last 30 minutes of Space Odyssey 2001 taking up much of the ending. When confronted with death, especially their own over and over, they have the option to turn to cynicism and gallows humour to cope. They're ready to die in space even before they actually do. Perhaps there's not much to say about them because they, understandably, don't have much to say for most of the game. And yet there is a way to hear them talk. When I heard there was a way of interacting with yourself via space-time shenanigans, I expected it to reveal some deep revelation about the thesis of the game. That's probably my Disco Elysium adult brain talking there. The trip back to the Ash Twin project after duplicating yourself is filled with this delicious anticipation, and yet the conversation you end up having with yourself is extremely, forgiving the pun, down to earth. And I laughed at that. Why was I expecting anything else? It's just me. If I met myself, would I be so philosophically inclined? Hell, I talk to myself every day without any grand realizations. It's mostly just embarrassing moments from earlier in my life, and hey, that's exactly what the protagonist remembers too. Since I did this encounter after reaching the game's ending, I'm not sure what I was expecting from it. I'd already seen the Heart of Outer Wilds, and I found it by searching the universe, not by looking into myself. Of course, that's not to say that the psyche of the protagonist is completely irrelevant. It's their internal landscape that you wander through after the universe ends. There's also wording that implies that the travellers that appear around the campfire are memories of the protagonist. Solanum, if you found her, says, I'm glad you remembered me. While a certain character from Echoes of the Eye asks, Are you certain you want to remember me? Neither of these characters share a language with you, and yet you understand them here. It's here that everyone seems to have accepted their deaths, even Chert. He says, The stars were beautiful, weren't they? Even if our star is ultimately what killed us. It's a hope, I think, of the protagonist, that we can all make our peace with death. Music creates the next universe, just like Gabbro's quantum poem, it's art that makes sense of it all. For an ending that takes place inside the protagonist, it has less to do with them than it does all the people who got them there. Sharing, collaboration, friendship, these are the things that Outer Wilds ultimately believes in. You still can't beat Outer Wilds, you can only reach the end. The birth of a new universe literally blows away your user interface, your health and fuel, location, eventually even the glass of your helmet. You get consumed by light one final time in one final supernova. The 30 second track that accompanies this is called Let There Be Light, 
as much a reference to the book of Genesis as it probably is to Isaac Asimov's short story, The Last Question. In the story, a supercomputer spends countless millennia trying to figure out how to reverse entropy, to stop the eventual death of the universe, only to figure out the answer once all light and life are gone. But it does succeed. Quote, the consciousness of AC encompassed all of what had once been a universe and brooded over what was now chaos. Step by step, it must be done. And AC said, let there be light. And there was light. Unquote. The last question is a powerful story because it conceives of time and humanity on scales that we aren't used to comprehending, and it wonders if we might be more wrapped up in the mechanisms of the universe than we think. Outer Wild sees faith and science as just as intertwined as the last question. Just as we come from the universe, the universe might also, in a way, come from us. If you lose your scout probe in the eye of the universe, it ends up in the next world, 14.3 billion years later after the credits. That symbol of knowledge, of wanting to know what's out there, is the last thing that lives on before the game ends. In so many ways, Outer Wild sees the pursuit of science as a humanist imperative, a way to both discover and rediscover parts of ourselves left out there in the cosmos. Knowledge gives us perspective, that we are all tiny living pieces of a much grander soul. That's no longer the full story of Outer Wilds. Echoes of the Eye is a very interesting supplement because it is, in some ways, the total opposite of the base game, and yet, I feel, utterly completes it. It is, in my mind, a perfect addition, adding a perspective I didn't even feel was missing from the game, which now seems impossible to remove. Unlike the base game, where you expand outwards to form a comprehensive picture of your solar system, where you came from, what the Nomai were doing, why they died, you go ever deeper and darker into one particular place. Echoes is set on a single space station, arguably a single room, and it ultimately answers a single question. Why did the signal from the eye of the universe just stop? The Nomai gained no satisfying answers to this, attributing it to the eye having a consciousness and simply choosing to silence its call. But the eye is not sentient. It's just the quantum center of the universe, and it's been broadcasting its signal to any living observer for thousands of years. At least, it would have, if not for interference. The most pervasive theme of this DLC is the unknown. The spaceship you enter is called The Stranger, and it first appears as an ominous shadow on the sun, something your fellow astronauts dismissed as a smudge on a camera lens. The first things you see once you board are traditional flying saucer UFOs, and is there any better symbol for the unexplained? Things lying just out of view of scientific observation? So you walk past those to the door inside and pull out your translator at new, glowing green text, only to find that it gives you nothing. Of course, it's only calibrated to know my writing. If you tell your friend Hal, who helped you build the translator, they rejoice at having a new project to work on for the next six months. You'll traverse this whole DLC without a single written or spoken word to guide you. A fitting choice for a story about not knowing. While the base game focuses on finding questions to answer them, Echoes of the Eye often leaves you without direct explanations. The one exception to this is your ship's log, although it doesn't fully describe everything you find. It's up to you to draw conclusions as to how the stranger works. For instance, I first entered the dream world almost by accident, before I found the slide reel telling me how to do it properly. I had the artifact with me and made an assumption as to how it worked, and it paid off, although I mostly stumbled around a bit confused before unceremoniously falling into the river and being booted out, as you can probably see. In this ship, knowledge is kept secretly, the inhabitants even destroying their own documents to hide it away. Contrast this with the Nomai who left their discoveries literally written on the walls for you to find. Echoes of the Eye's focus on the unknown makes sense given its increased horror elements, although you can dampen these somewhat with a helpful reduced fright setting. Its horror primarily manifests in dark sections, where you're asked to avoid the gaze of alien lanterns. 
Just as light allows you to open doors, activate elevators and view slide reels, darkness conceals you. Frequently you'll put yourself in total darkness, even darker than space, to avoid your pursuers. It's quite hard to see in these circumstances, to an almost obnoxious extent in stealth sections, although if you have the know-how you can get to all the archives without running into a single pursuer. Even the campfires here are different, no longer warm reminders of home, but lit with unearthly green fire, now symbols of the strange knowledge they hold. At least in Dark Bramble you could outspeed the anglerfish in your ship. To dodge a stranger, you have to hide. I've mentioned the aliens who inhabit the stranger a couple times now. Since Echoes of the Eye lacks any written dialogue, they don't really have a set name, although I've heard them referred to variously as ghost birds, owls, or even alks by fans, for consonants perfectly designed to make me use my whole mouth to pronounce them. Calling them strangers feels right to me, since you never get any of their names. Unlike the Harthians and the Nomai, these aliens feel more fallible and more flawed. The Nomai always had a slight utopian quality, being ideal scientists. They left growing ecosystems alone, which allowed the Harthians to evolve, they struggled with fueling their time machine on the destruction of a sun, and ultimately their search for knowledge seemed totally for its own sake. Solanum even explains her identify and explain stones to you on the quantum moon as pillars of Nomai philosophy, saying, quote, to seek out and to understand is our way of living, unquote. The strangers serve as a complete contrast to all this. They shut knowledge and themselves away, and strip their own world bare to follow a signal they later shun. There's a bitter irony in the sacrifice they made to create their ship. What they destroyed was worth far more than what they destroyed it for. Trying to recapture it, they recreated what they lost in a digital afterlife and eventually lost themselves inside, now left as simulacra forever mourning a world they ruined. Inadvertently, their fear of the eye, and the way it would let new life grow from their deaths, made them freeze themselves in time, incapable of giving anything to anyone else in the universe. This eternal internal preservation meant that they couldn't be found like the Nomai, save for the shadow they leave on your sun. They've become absent from history, they're just a blank spot in the universe. It's a disturbing story, only made darker if you trap yourself inside of the simulation. If only you could wake up, the ending slide reads. While Outer Wilds believes that knowledge is an unalloyed good, Echoes complicates that by showing how fear can contort knowledge into something destructive, and asks you whether you accept that, whether knowledge is worth having even when it's uncomfortable or scary. While the base game of Outer Wilds asks you to complete the Nomai's final project, Echoes of the Eye demands you to subvert the Stranger's world. Although the simulation seems initially a little supernatural, it's revealed to be far more polygonal beneath, in what I think is probably the best reveal of information in the whole game. You enter one of the Forbidden Archives expecting a code, and instead you find a way of seeing the Matrix. From there on, what you'll do can't help but feel a little like speedrunning techniques. To reach the end, you interrupt load zones, go out of bounds, and stay alive and dead at the same time. I even found one of the invisible walkways by accident. Although I didn't know what it was at the time and didn't want to press my luck, I was vindicated hours later when I saw that yes, in fact, that was a hidden path I found. The gameplay here resembles the leaps of knowledge required to beat the base game, but taken even further. You push the boundaries of this artificial world until they break. You progress by going past the simulation, not by obeying its rules, and getting the three codes you initially assume you'll need. That final trick, that the three locks you need to get past can be completely bypassed, is one of the most impressive to me, and yet it seems so obvious. Why would the strangers have left any trace of how to free their captive, after all? I felt quite smart at points while beating Outer Wilds, but I never felt as outsmarted as I did in Echoes of the Eye. I thought I knew this game back to front, until it proved, one last time, that there will always be new questions to ask. The search for truth is worth it because, no matter how confident we are in our knowledge, there is so, so much that we still don't know.
The result of beating Echoes of the Eye isn't an alternative conclusion to the game. It's a conversation. In keeping with its theme of the unknown, for the majority of loops in the DLC, you'll never be 100% sure of what you're doing, just finding the next bit to understand. It's hard to not feel like you might be making a mistake as you unlock the prisoner's chamber, and the game toys with that expectation, as their hand grasps a lantern from the darkness with a sting of alien synth. But, of course, they just gently walk into view. You join this person in the realm of the dead as they finish their story, revealing themselves to be the reason why the eye signal was picked up in the first place. While the gnome I left behind for you might allow you to make a new universe, but this simple act feels just as powerful here, a tiny gesture of kindness that echoed forwards in time far further than the prisoner could ever have known. The prisoner returned knowledge that the other strangers would rather have ignored, that we will all one day die, and that the universe will continue without us. If you reach the game's true ending after completing the DLC, the prisoner is there, found in a grave only if you blow out candles representing the three species of life in this solar system. Even accepting the truth of that complete annihilation, the prisoner still warns you about fear. Quote, when my kind found the eye and realized what it was capable of, they were terrified. It was too difficult a truth, like a light too bright to look upon directly, it burned them. What they could not unlearn was hidden away in darkness, obfuscated and lost. They did not want to see their story end." Unquote. There's a smallness to Echoes of the Eye's final moments that I like, because as you talk to the prisoner through images, you get to tell them that their story didn't end. You wouldn't be an astronaut if not for the Nomai, if not for the museum where you gazed at their ancient work, starry-eyed, and those Nomai wouldn't have come here if not for the signal. You realise, at last, that you're another echo of the eye, finally returning to the prisoner to free them. While the ending of Outer Wilds has universal stakes and scale, despite its focus on the protagonist, the ending of Echoes feels even more powerfully personal. Even if the consequences of it don't continue into another timeline, just letting the prisoner know is enough to have an impact. The final vision the prisoner leaves you with is one of hopeful kinship, that the two of you are the same. You, like the prisoner, sought the truth, even if it didn't accommodate you, and both of you share a universe, despite your worlds and technologies being so different. You are passengers of the same river, stargazers looking into the sky with the same wonder. You are both parts of the universe, witnessing itself. And as the game's main melodic theme started playing on the prisoner's instrument, I was touched in a way that I didn't expect to be from a horror-themed expansion. But Echoes uses its horror elements to show that the search for truth isn't an easy thing, whether that's scientific, philosophical, or emotional truth. The act of searching, in and of itself, is worth it. Even if there's only one other person in the universe who can see you do it and go, thank you. In the release of Echoes of the Eyes deluxe album, Outer Wilds' composer, Andrew Prolo, asks a very interesting question. Quote, what if the Outer Wilds universe was real, and we heard an alien voyager sending out their own golden record message as signals found in deep space? How would we translate them, and how could we connect with their melodies as a reflection of our own lives if we are already living them?" Unquote. The real golden record was sent into space 45 years ago now, and will probably never be found by extraterrestrials. Yet it says a lot about us that we'd send it there, that we're concerned with how we'll be perceived by the cosmos. Hilariously, you can find some of it on NASA's SoundCloud, which exists, and I'll link that in the description. It seems to be more important that we remember what's on it, a vision of humanity, of Earth, that we want to engrave into gold. It feels like a crime that, after all this virtual ink I've spilled, I haven't spent any time on the music of Outer Wilds, and maybe that's because it speaks for itself. I think the music actually stands out because it's absent for most of the game, unless you look for it with your signal scope. If you do, each astronaut plays a different instrumental part for the track Travelers, perhaps representative of their different perspectives which eventually come together at the ending. But you can hear them earlier than that if you align your signal scope just right, 
and there's even an achievement for that. We make the music of the spheres, not the heavens themselves. The banjo in the game's title theme was recorded across two points in time. Once at the beginning of development, and once at the end, seven years later. That aspect of it fits so well, because the whole game's a conversation with the past. The Nomai's past, to be sure, but also your past, using the sacrifice of your previous selves to move forwards. In Outer Wilds, music seems to represent knowledge itself. Each instrument around the ending campfire adds a different perspective to the universe and to the harmony, with Solanum and the prisoner enriching it only if you've shown the understanding needed to find them. The universe is made of these differing views, because each of us has a piece of it inside us, and that's one of the final, most powerful ways that Outer Wilds advocates for its collective humanism. It's a fallacy to think that science will save the world. But what it provides us, what it can provide us with, is perspective. The cosmonauts who first left Earth didn't get a second try, whether they came back or not. How many times have people died just to touch the beyond, to reach some eye of the universe? Not because our world isn't big enough, but because it's only when you're up so high that you can see the whole thing for what it is. Not just a pale blue dot, but a dot. So, so small, and so very precious in its smallness. We, humanity, probably won't be like the denizens of Timber Hearth. We weren't born at the end of the universe, and we probably won't get to see it. More likely we'll be like the Nomai, disappearing in the flash of a gamma ray burst or choking on asteroid ash, or maybe, like the strangers, just burning the world ourselves. Yet Outer Wilds' faith in humanity is still obvious and profound. It hopes that, if we only have 22 minutes left, we use it well and seek the truth. Even if, as Echoes of the Eye notes, the truth wasn't made for us. We'll make our place in the universe anyway. It's taken about 13.7 billion years for any of us to exist. I don't know how many years we'll still be around for, but if we are a way for the cosmos to know itself, if we're each echoes of our universe, I hope we keep looking up. I hope we can share this campfire of a world, take up our instruments, and play. Together. Oh.